You see, I believe that God has a life that is his best for you. That God has good plans for your life. That he has good purposes for you. God has a life planned out for you that I would call God's best for you. But for many of us, we give into the temptation where we settle for so much less than what God has for you. I want to encourage you not to settle for less than God's best for you. You see, I believe that every human being can do extraordinary things. But not everyone accomplishes great things. You see, for some of us, great things are being on that big stage. But I believe that great things really are the small things, the simple things that honor God and, gl and glorify his name in relationship with those that are around us. One of my mentors loves to say that success is when those that are closest to you love and respect you the most. He defines success as when those that are closest to you love and respect you the most. You see, as you navigate through the journey of life, it's important for you and I to know that we have been set apart. God has set you and I apart. And when you know that God has set you apart, then you go about life differently. When you know that God has set you apart, you realize that you are not an ordinary person, but you are a woman of purpose. You are a man of purpose. I believe that one of the most important things in life is to walk through life having an awareness and a knowledge of God's purpose for you. One of the most important things is when you and I know our purpose, that you are born for a purpose. You see, I believe that every man is born as a gift to their generation. When you read in Jeremiah chapter 1 and from verse 5, God says, before you are conceived in a mother's womb, I knew you. Before you are born, I set you apart. I have appointed you as a prophet to the nations. And so it's important for us to realize that we have a lifelong calling. That our calling is to pursue God's calling upon our lives and his purposes. Our place is to pursue God's calling upon our lives and his purposes. I want to challenge you to live your life having that awareness that your life has been set apart. You see, at the end of it all, it doesn't matter the things that we accomplished, the wealth that we amassed, how many records we set or accomplished. What matters more than anything else is did you live a life that is God-centered? Did you live a life that is a God-honoring life? You know, when you read in Zechariah chapter 1, the people of Judah have come back from exile. They've been in exile for 70 years. And as they come back, they begin to settle in the land. They begin to focus on the task that's ahead of them. As they begin this new season, God speaks to them through one of his prophets, Zechariah. In Zechariah chapter 1 and verse 2, the word of the Lord comes to the people through Zechariah and it says, The Lord was very angry with your ancestors. Therefore, tell the people, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Return to me, declares the Lord Almighty, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Zechariah is saying to the people, as you come into this new season, this is God's word to you. Return to me, and I will return to you. Says the Lord Almighty says to you, return to me, and I will return to you. You see, Zechariah was, con was, was passing on this message, and God was calling the people to return to him, to return to him with their hearts, to submit their hearts to his lordship. He was telling them, challenging them to return to him in their actions. They had gone through a time in exile. As they came back and settled in the land, God was calling them to submit their hearts to him and to live lives that would honor and glorify him, to return with their hearts, to return in their actions, but also to return in their worship. You see, in a season like this, as we look ahead, our theme for this year is breaking new ground. But I believe that we cannot break into new ground if we do not first return to that first love, if we do not return to that place of loving and honoring and glorifying the name of God in our lives. 
You see, a turning to God requires two things. It requires a life of surrender, a life that is surrendered to him. But it also requires an act of constant submission. A life surrendered before God, but also a heart that is submitted to him. You see, each one of us battles with the cravings of our flesh. The cravings of our flesh go against a life of surrender and submission. Our flesh is not naturally drawn to submit and to surrender before God. Actually, our flesh does not want to surrender and to submit. Our flesh wants to have things done in its own way. The flesh wants for things to be done my way. And when you begin doing things your way, that is the very beginning of living a life of sin. Because I must do things my way, I will do what I want when I want to. And when you think about it, at the root of a sinful life is a prideful heart that elevates self before anything else. At the root of sin is a prideful heart that elevates self before and above everything else. You see, when my life is all about having my way, when all that I'm focused on is having my way, then I set the stage for living a life of destruction. My relationships end up destroyed because I must have things my way. I make the wrong choices because everything is centered on a selfish gratification. You see, the thing about sin is that sin will take you further than you're willing to go. Sin will make you stagnate in a season in your life. Sin will make you stay longer in one season than you intended to. Sin will cost you more than you're willing to pay. Sin will take you further than you're willing to go. You see, as we go through life, it's easy for you and I to feel as if we are the ones that have a hold on the struggles in our lives. That when you're battling with sin, it's easy for you and I to feel as if we are in control. We have a hold on this thing. But in actual sense, it is sin that has a hold on you. It is the forces of darkness that actually have a hold on your life. You see, you and I can be deluded to feel as if we are free. We are free because we can do what we want. We are free because we can go wherever we want. We are free because we live a life that is so centered on self. Yet in actual sense, that which seems like freedom is actually a place of bondage. You see, freedom is found in only one place. True freedom is only found in God's presence. God's presence. There in God's presence is true freedom. There in God's presence is his best for our lives. For many of us, it is our, our pride, our pride and our selfish desire that actually stands in the way of living a life of freedom. It sounds as if I have freedom because I can do what I want. But our pride and our selfishness actually stand in the way of us living a life of freedom. You see, when you read in Genesis chapter 4, from the very beginning, Cain and Abel bring before God a sacrifice. God looks at one sacrifice with, and, and is pleased with it. But on the other sacrifice, he does not look with the same delight. And Cain, his heart is troubled. He's jealous of his brother, Abel. And God speaks to Cain. God speaks to Cain the words that he still speaks to you and I. You see, it says, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? He's asking a question. But then he goes on and he says, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But then God also says to him, but if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. You must rule over it. You see, that's a place, a point of tension that so many of us face on a daily basis. That temptation to give in to sin. 
Cain sees the sacrifice of the brother is better than his. And he gets jealous and selfish. And instead of making a commitment to do better, he gives in to the sin and the temptation. Ends up taking his brother's life. Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. You see, God calls you and I to live holy lives. God calls you and I to be sober in how we live, in the choices that we make. I love what First Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 says. It says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. The scriptures don't end there. Verse 9 says, resist him, standing in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kinds of suffering. Verse 10 says, and God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ. After you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever more. You see, God makes you and I a promise that he will give us the strength to be able to overcome. That our challenges are not unique to us. Our challenges are not unique to us that others around us have faced the same challenges. You see, God's desire for you and I in this new year, God's desire for you is that you would live a life that is centered on him. That you would live a life that is fully and wholly centered on him. Many of us have chosen and settled for a counterfeit kind of life. We live a counterfeit faith. You see, many of us have accepted the lie that everything that is fulfilling, everything that brings joy, everything that is meaningful is found away from the presence of God. We have believed that lie, that everything that brings joy and meaning and fulfillment is found away from the presence of God. Yet the truth is that everything that brings joy and fulfillment and meaning in our lives is found in the presence of God. That in his presence is the fullness of joy. So don't settle. Don't settle for the counterfeit. Don't settle for a life that is so much lower than God's best for you. Allow your life to be driven by the purposes of God and God's calling. Seek to live a holy life, to live a life that is pleasing before God, in the small things, in the big things, that you and I would live with an awareness that we have been set apart, that our lives have been set apart, that God has called us, he has called us away from the pursuit of selfish pleasures and desires. And he then calls us and invites us to pursue intimacy with him. To pursue intimacy with a holy and a loving God. That God's desire is that you and I in every single moment, you and I in the choices we make, in our relationships, in the things that we do in our actions, that we would desire to live lives that honor him and glorify him. You see, when you read in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 1, written really about the very beginning of the time in exile for the people of Judah. As they are in exile, Daniel, a teenager, finds himself also there in exile. King Nebuchadnezzar takes those who are really the top cream of the society and he takes them with him to Babylon. Daniel was one of these young men that was outstanding. As Daniel found himself in this foreign land, separated from his own flesh and blood, as Daniel found himself in this pagan land, he chooses in his heart. Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8 says, but Daniel re resolved in his heart. He resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. 
You see, Daniel must have been aware that this food probably would have been offered to idols. Babylon was a pagan nation. They were a pagan people. They had these beautiful buildings, this beautiful architecture, but it was a place of great wickedness. There is no form of wickedness that is new. You see, the devil does not have any new schemes. What we see has already been. There is no evil that is new under the sun. All that is has already been. Babylon was a wicked place. But there in that wicked place, Daniel realized that he was set apart, that God has the purpose for his life, that God was sovereign. He realized that God had allowed him to go into captivity for a reason. And there in captivity, he set his heart to honor God. You see, when you and I live without allowing God to be at the center, when we live sinful lives that are centered around the flesh, at the very end of life is only regret. At the very end is only regret. You see, I've never met someone that's near the end of their life that can see the end approaching who says, I wish I had lived a bit longer so that I could indulge in sin a bit more. It's always a time of reflection, of regret, of saying, I wish I had lived more for God and given of my life more for him. You see, when you know that God has set you apart, you are careful not to settle for anything less. And so Daniel made a commitment that he would not settle for this food that was offered to idols, that he would not partake in the sacrifices with the idols, that his life would be a life that would be God-honoring, that his focus would be to go before God and to exalt him and to honor him. And what you see all through the book of Daniel is God uses this young man. God uses this group of young men because their hearts are set apart for him, because they separated themselves from everyone else and they chose to focus their eyes on him. You see, if you turn to 1 Thessalonians in chapter 4, reading from verse 3, this is what the word of God says. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. The word of God goes on and he says, and that in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. It says the Lord will punish all who commit such sins as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Verse 8 says, Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. It's God's will that you and I should live sanctified lives, that we should live holy lives, that we should live lives that honor God. You see, to pursue the purposes of God, you and I must turn away. You and I must turn away from sinful habits. Are there habits that have become a place of bondage for you? Are there things you are doing that you know are not God-honoring? You and I must turn away from habits that are not God-honoring. For us to be able to fulfill the purpose of God, you and I must turn away from mindsets. Mindsets that do not honor God. Mindsets that do not see the value of the people that God has placed around us. Mindsets that do not love and give of themselves. In order for us to honor God, you and I must turn away from belief systems. Belief systems that do not honor and glorify the name of Jesus in our lives. For us to be able to break new ground, for us to be able to advance in the promises of God, we have to turn away from that which would hinder us 
from becoming all that God has called us to be. I love the words of Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off, let us throw off everything. Let us throw off not one thing, not the other, everything, everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us. Let us throw off those things that look as if we are the ones that are in control, yet they have gained a hold of us. Let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us. And let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. Let us run with perseverance because yes, there will be challenges. There will be trials, moments of tribulation. But let us run with perseverance, pursuing a life of holiness, pursuing a life that honors God, pursuing a life that is not centered on self and the desires of the flesh, but that is centered on honoring God in every single action, in every single decision. You see, what I love about the life of Daniel was that Daniel had a posture. He had a posture of heart, a posture that said, I am not of this world, but I'm in this world. I am in this world, but I am not of this world. Daniel was so aware of where he was, but he was more aware of who he was, that he was an instrument in the hands of God. Daniel had what I call a kingdom mindset. He knew that, yes, he was in exile, but there in exile, he had a kingdom assignment. He knew that God had positioned him there, that God had put him there for a time, for a season. God has positioned you where you are for a season. And it's so important that you understand the purpose for which he has positioned you where you are. That you realize that God's calling is upon your life. That you allow God to cause you to thrive where he has planted you. You see, when we have a kingdom mindset, we know that yes, we are in this world, but we are not of this world. When we have a kingdom mindset, we are aware that God has positioned us here for a time such as this. But also when we have a kingdom mindset, our outlook is one of servants and stewards. We realize that I'm only a servant of the Most High God. I'm a steward of what he has placed in my hands. You see, Daniel was aware that it wasn't about his agenda. It was about God's agenda. When you have a kingdom mindset, you're not driven by your own agenda but you're driven by God's agenda for your life. As you go into this year, what is God's agenda for you? What is God's purpose for you? What is his calling upon your life? How do you become a co-laborer with him? How do you fulfill the purposes of God? How do you break into new ground? It begins from a posture of surrender. Of saying, Lord, you've given me this life, and now I come and I give it back to you. I surrender my life to you. And making an intentional decision to be set apart, choosing to be set apart, to be removed from the schemes of the evil one, to be removed from where we do not honor God and to be set apart for him. You see, when we are set apart, we realize that we are called to be vessels of honor. Vessels of honor instruments in the Lord's hands. But also breaking into new ground requires you and I to constantly submit, to submit to the leading of the Holy Spirit of our lives. That we submit. We submit to the leading of the Holy Spirit of our lives. That we surrender before him. We give our lives to him. And then we submit our hearts. You see, I spent some time this week with a family that is so dear to us. There is a young man in that family that for years battled with alcohol addiction, lost his job, lost so many things, almost lost his life. And I remember for years, we would pray for that young man. 
who would pray believing that God would set him free from the hold of alcoholism. That God would set him free from that place of bondage. That God would set him free and restore his life. For years we would pray every single week. Me and his younger brother would meet and pray over him. After a number of years, when we were almost giving up, he came to that point in his life where he asked for help. And he said, the way that my life is going, I don't see a future for me. He went into a rehabilitation center. In that rehabilitation center, Teens Challenge, he gave his life to the Lord. And God began to do a new work in him. God turned his life around. From someone who others had given up on, God turned his life around, began to use him to minister to other people that are battling with alcohol and drug addiction. You see, that young man is now one of our managers for one of our centers, one of our teen challenge centers. God turned his life around. God saved him from the point of death, restored his life, gave him back his family. And now he's thriving, thriving and serving the purposes of God. I can tell story after story of people that I know that God turned their lives around. And he is writing a much bigger story than they could have ever thought or imagined. You see, I believe that it's the same for you and I. That God has so much more ahead of us. That God has a future for you. That God wants to use you for the glory and honor of his name. That God wants to fulfill his purposes through you. His purposes in your family, in your city, in your neighborhood, in your nation. That God wants you to be the answer to the challenges that you see around you. But that will only happen out of a life that is wholly surrendered to him. Out of a posture of submission. I want to challenge you as you go into the year that's ahead. That you would honor God in everything that you do. You see, everything that I've talked about begins from just a decision. A point of decision. A decision to surrender our lives before him. Maybe for you, you're struggling with many things. Maybe there are many battles around you, in your family, in your home. Maybe you're at a point of despair. But you are not created to do life alone. You are not created to do life by yourself. You have a helper. You have a savior. You have a loving God. He desires to carry you through to lead you and to guide you. You're crying in your heart. You're saying, Lord, I need a new beginning. I need a new start. I want to start afresh. I want a fresh start. Would you just open your hands and bow before him and pray with me this short prayer. Just say these words with me. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for your love that you died on the cross for me that I would know you. I confess that I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Take my hand and lead me and guide me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Just that simple prayer. If you have prayed that simple prayer, you are now born again. We celebrate you. We celebrate with you. But even beyond that, there is a celebration in the heavenly places a celebration over your life. If you have prayed that prayer for the very first time, send us a text on 21210 or enter it into the comment section. Just enter your name in the comment section and we will pray with you. Send us your name where you're watching us from. One of our pastoral team members will call you and pray with you. And guess what? We're going to send you the gift of a Bible. The gift of a Bible so that you can begin this new life afresh with some instructions and help you connect to a Bible-believing church. God bless you. Maybe for you, yes, you're born again, but you're battling in your heart, and you're saying, Lord, yes, it's a new year, but there is so much that's weighing on my heart. I'm battling with so many things. Maybe you're battling with sin in your life. Maybe you're battling with depression, with hopelessness. Maybe you're fighting in your marriage, fighting in your relationship. You have a helper. You have a helper. Would you just pray with me? Lord Jehovah God, I want to speak your covering upon my brother and my sister. Lord Jesus, would you remember them? 
I pray that this would be the best life of their year. The Lord Jehovah God, you would turn around circumstances. You would turn around circumstances in their marriage. You would turn around circumstances in their life. Where there is sickness, Lord, I pray for healing in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray where there are strife in relationship that you would restore. As they're waiting on you for breakthrough this year, would you open doors for them? Would you make a way for them? Lord, open doors. Show yourself mighty and show yourself strong. I pray that those that are around them will testify of your hand of blessing upon them, that indeed your hand and your anointing is upon their lives. I pray that they will be victorious, that the work of their hands will be fruitful, that the evil one will not steal from them this year, that they would live lives of purpose and that they would fulfill your calling and your purposes in their generation. So I bless them today in their going out and their coming in. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Amen and amen. Know that we love you. Have a wonderful week. God bless you.